Okay, we're here for another uh, Media Law Chat. I'm here with my former student, which makes me so, so super proud, Scott Memel, a University of Wisconsin-Madison grad, now a uh, graduate student at the University of Minnesota. So Scott, um, as everybody who watches knows, these chats are about one of my top Media Law cases, and here's why. So what case have you chosen? Sure, so I chose Near v. Minnesota uh, from 1931. All right, we're going way back into the archives, right? We are, we yeah. are. We're going way back in the archives to, uh, what's great about the case is I'm currently sitting in Minnesota, sitting in Minneapolis, yep. in the same county where all this was taking place, right? So it, it gives me a little bit of goosebumps to be able to actually talk about the case where it happened. Well, that's awesome. Why is it one of your top cases? Well, really there are kind of three reasons or three levels, I guess. So one, the ruling is very important. Right? The idea that prior restraints, except in extreme circumstances, are going to be unconstitutional under the First Amendment, and that there's this heavy presumption against prior restraints. And in this case, you know, they not o Chief Justice Hughes not only emphasizes you know, that prior restraints go against everything that the First Amendment is going to stand for, but really emphasizes the importance of the free press and the role that it plays in society. Um, the second reason that it's so important is, you know, I don't know if we get a case like Pentagon Papers without near Minnesota. Right. I think it sets an important string of precedent, um, including Pentagon Papers, but several others outside of even the prior restraint context, where we get some really favorable rulings for the media and for the press. And so, you know, it's important not just because of the ruling, but also because I don't know if we are where we are today and getting other important rulings without this case, again, all the way back in 1931. Right. You know, it's it's an interesting, um, there was such a nascent stage for First Amendment jurisprudence. There really wasn't, we really weren't doing much in the prior century um, related to this. And, and then, you know, we're back and forth um, with um, Schenck and Abrams and thinking that that's the ground on which we'll be tilling First Amendment issues. But then Near pops up. What's interesting to you about this set of facts or this case in particular? Well, I think it's important to note that, you know, Jay Neer, you know, writing for the Saturday Press, wasn't a great guy, right? Even <laughs> yeah. by 1920s and 1930s standards, right? Yeah, I tell, I tell my students, First Amendment, First Amendment history is littered with horrible people, just horrible people. <laughs> Jay Neer is a great example of this, right? <laughs> Where, you know, even by those standards, you know, pretty racist, pretty bigoted, right? But he and his, you know, fellow writers, you know, others contributing to the Saturday Press, they wanted to be muckrakers, right? They were looking back at during, you know, the first couple decades of the 20th century and going, we want to expose corruption and we want to expose what's going on. And that's what they tried to do right now. You know, what they published was generally truthful, maybe a little sensational in places, maybe a little problematic, especially by today's standards. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it's important to note, not the most enviable figure, but they, like you said, Katie, are doing very important things uh, for the First Amendment, but also just trying to expose all the wrongdoing that was going on in the Twin Cities at the time. Yeah, and what, historically, where were we in the Twin Cities at that time? You know, we always we always joke about Minnesota nice. <laughs> Near was not Minnesota nice. But what, what was happening? What were they trying to expose? Yeah, well, so it's a situation where, if you picture the context, we're obviously before World War II still, but we're very much in the throes of the Great Depression, right? We're in prohibition. So what we're seeing is a lot of organized crime mm -hmm. is developing. And the problem was, in Minneapolis, but also across the United States, the police and the government, and to some degree, even some members of the press were involved in that, to some degree. And so what Nier and his cronies were exposing was the chief of police was taking bribes and was involved in corruption in different ways. Um, there's a lot of organized crime just in general, because what was happening was, you know, the Twin Cities are right along the Mississippi, right? Mm -hmm. And so crime would go right up and down the Mississippi and would <laughs> make stops in Minnesota, in Minneapolis and St. Paul to, you know, do whatever it is they needed to do, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mir was pointing out not only how all that crime was happening, but pointing to public officials like the chief of police um, as those that were involved with this. Um, now, the issue being where this gets a little problematic was this was a very anti-Semitic kind of effort by Mir. Right. So he's accusing Jewish gangs of being part of all this. And there's some nugget of truth to that, right? That's not completely fabricated or false. But again, 
you know, making some pretty bold claims that obviously made people in Minnesota a little upset. Mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So the court takes this on and um, it's not a sweeping decision, right? <laughs> it's it's oh. yeah, not by any strength. So talk a little bit about the about the majority opinion, but then also the dissents and, and, and where that leaves us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So by four decision. So this really barely squeaks through. <laughs> uh, the chief justice is the one who writes the opinion. Um, and does name several exceptions, right? So to your point, Katie, not only is it a 5-4 ruling, but it's also a case where it's not absolute, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't saying no prior restraints ever, right? This is saying that there's a heavy presumption against prior restraints, but there's gonna be some instances where it's going to be allowed. And in some sense, the court's really looking through a crystal ball, right? And they're looking at what would become areas of unprotected speech today. Obscenity being one, fighting words is another <laughs> category they mentioned. And you know, they talk about things like obstructing recruiting. You know, we're talking about you know, post World War One at this point. You know, they don't know what's coming with World War II, but they're still worried about how this affects the military and troops. And they're worried about troop movements and other military actions during wartime. Mm -hmm. um, and so really the dissents in a lot of way in a lot of ways um, they're focusing on what the minnesota supreme court said which was along the lines of yes the press is important they're kind of looking at the facts and going you know jane near and the saturday press this is kind of bordering on you know defamatory this is kind of bordering on is this actually true right mm -hmm. and so they see the value in the public nuisance law that all of this is ha happening under in minnesota they call it the minnesota gag law at the time. Mm -hmm. And what they're seeing is that, you know, maybe there is some utility to this, right? You know, we don't just want rampant kind of speculation about the government and undermining, you know, the government in different ways. And that was kind of the nexus of what they were concerned about and wanted to uphold that law. Um, whereas the majority didn't like the idea that the law in Minnesota would not only stand, but could spread to Right. And one of the things that's so fascinating to me about 5-4 decisions is that, you know, it, the, the vote is lost to time. <laughs> that, you know, most people, you know, when you think about the, the strength of Nier as a precedent, that, you know, it's like, well, okay, what does the First Amendment bar, above all, prior restraint? <laughs> well, we were one vote away from that not being the case, right? Um, it's just, it's just, it's just absolutely fascinating to me. What do you, how do you think it holds up today? You know, certainly we had the Pentagon Papers in the interim, but but where are we today with the strength of Nier as a precedent? So kind of at the base level, I'd like to think that given a similar set of circumstances, that if this went to the Supreme Court, that it would still hold, right? Mm -hmm. That there would be a similar ruling, whether it's 5-4 or not, that the court would reach a similar conclusion. Um, the key is that Nier they're following some precedent, right? This didn't come out of nowhere, right? right. They're set, setting cases like Patterson v. Colorado mm -hmm. um, and some other cases where it wasn't the focus of the Supreme Court and then state courts as well. But they were saying that, you know, we're really nervous about prior restraints, right? We're kind of nervous about censorship by the government. And so it's not coming out of nowhere, right? So they are citing some precedent that existed. And so our Supreme Court today, you know, a lot of the First Amendment rulings we've seen recently, they rely pretty heavily on precedent. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think, okay, you know, maybe this ruling comes out kind of along the same lines. Um, but I think the concern is if we go back to, you know, Jane Neer not being a great character, if we take these facts and plop them into the 21st century and you've got an alt-right blogger, right, mm -hmm. or somebody posting on Twitter, you know, and of course, the caveat being somehow the First Amendment has to apply, right? It can't be a case where, you know, a private company like Twitter's shutting down the speech. It has to be right. the government in some way. But if we get a set of facts that works out that way, there may be some on the court that would be a little more hesitant about protecting this kind of speech, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's the press or a private figure, whatever the case may be, they may be a little concerned about that. Um, so one thing I was thinking was, do they maybe expand the exceptions a little bit? If this comes out today, are the exceptions maybe a little bit broader than they were in 31? Um, strikes me at least as one set of possibilities, but I guess the bottom line is I would hope that the court would see the importance of protecting the press in this way, despite you know some of the hesitancy and some of the distrust that we have in the press. Yeah. 
Anyway, continue. Yeah. I also think with the, the current makeup of the court and sort of deference to the executive, what it would mean if this wasn't near versus Minnesota, um, but near versus United States. Um, and, you know, sort of um, not maybe relitigating the Pentagon Papers in, in this time, but with national security as the issue and deference to the federal executive, I think it would be an interesting question. The one exception in near that I think is just ripe for some relitigation is the fighting words. If yeah, you ever yeah. want to talk about a muddled, messy <laughs> issue in First Amendment law, it is, it is that issue. And, you know, the... A lot of students um, in my classes, when we get into the thorny issue of hate speech, are just like, well, what's that fighting words thing? And why does that, why is that protected? And so I think that's something that um, in today's landscape, when you talk about, say, an alt-right blogger, you know, that is the kind of case where I could see clarification, not certainly... I don't think we're in an age of overturning near by any stretch, uh, but clarification of those exceptions, that would be an area that's ripe. Absolutely, absolutely. And the near court, they called it words of force, mm -hmm. right? And so now it's kind of switched and changed into fighting words, which, as you said, kind of the bottom line is we're still not entirely sure what that means, yeah. right? What's included and what isn't included. So yeah, you know, a case like this going up to the court, it may not just be about prior restraints, right? They could be focusing on these exceptions and trying to examine them a little right. bit more closely. And maybe it does mean a re-examination of Pentagon Papers, which is a per curiam decision where, you know, there's two paragraphs, right? Everything else is dicta. Besides yep. that. And so they could take the opportunity to kind of reevaluate that case. Would make me, and I'm sure you and other press advocates a little bit nervous. Right, right. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot in this case besides prior restraints that could be could be the focus of the court. Yeah. What do you think near means for um, for the average person today? What is if if you if you said if you said to you know my brother, hey, this is a really important case in U.S. history. Here's what it means for you. What does it mean for us socially? To me, it means you know if you pick up the Minneapolis Star Tribune or you follow the reporter on Twitter and they're covering coronavirus, for example, and they're critical of the Trump administration, you'll be able to read that in the newspaper. It'll be there. Right. You'll be able to see that, you know, on different platforms that, you know, the Trump administration or, you know, even if it was the Obama administration. Right. It doesn't just has, have to be our current current president. Mm -hmm. Any kind of government, including at the state level, too, they couldn't just tell the press, nope, you're not allowed to publish that. Right. End of story. Yeah. You know, that's why this is important. Right. It, it allows the press to do its functions. Right. To inform the public. Right to hold government and law enforcement and other areas accountable, right? That's the real tangible importance of this case. And that's what the New York court talked about. They yeah. said, that's the importance of the press. If we don't let the press, you know, criticize public officials and expose this kind of corruption that was going on in the Twin Cities at the time, we're undermining the very importance of the press in general. And so, you know, whether Republican, Democrat, independent, anywhere in between, it means that you can get the information you need from the source, whether it's from the far right, far left, or in the middle, yeah. um, that you want to see and that you need to see. Yeah, and I think it's important to think about it not just in terms of the presidential administration, but but the power of government, you know, at the local level. Um, you know, your your school board or your your town council. We had a just a fascinating case here in Wisconsin a few months ago with a with some members of a county board who uh, who threatened to prosecute journalists who did not verba print a press release verbatim about contamination of wells of water within wells and. Uh, I, I got a, an interview request from the Associated Press asking me to comment on this, and the interview request described, it, and I said, well, they got to be out of their minds. Like, there's no way that a county government would think that they could do this. Um, but sure enough, they, they, they did, and um, there was no law under which people would be prosecuted. It was a classic, classic example of prior restraint, even though it would be post-publication prosecution, but an attempt to uh, muzzle the news media. And so I think it's a lesson, near is a lesson that we just have to keep learning over and over and over again and educating people over and over and over again that there are remedies after something has been published, but the Absolutely. government is at its worst power when it's, when it's the power to muzzle you before you engage in expression. Exactly, and the only thing I'd add is, you know, 
to those that are maybe a little more, you know, a little more distrustful of the press, right, or maybe a little more cynical about the press, they may say, well, then are we going to let journalists just publish whatever they want? And the answer is exactly what you said. The answer is no. That's not what Mir does, right? There are exceptions, right? And, you know, this is where ethics comes into play, too, that you'd mm -hmm. hope that journalists wouldn't publish troop movements anyway, right, if that right. could the lives of people and, and those sorts of things. But again, it's that idea, right, that this is focusing on prior restraints, which are seen to be the worst, right, right. the worst under First Amendment jurisprudence. But there are other ways that, you know, that are less impactful on the press that, whether it's the government or private individuals can take if, if needed. But, yeah. uh, but to your point, exactly, to emphasize just how important your, or how problematic prior restraints are in particular um, is, is the bottom line importance of, of this case. All right. Well, Scott, I can't thank you enough. It's so it's so good to see you and to be proud of all that you are achieving and to have, you know, past students share with current students. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so oh, it's, much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. And to all your students, you've got a great professor. You've got a great <laughs> oh. institution. I'm wearing my uh. sweater right now. So, <laughs> Way um, to wear I'll that badger pride. pride. Way to wear that better. Even up in the in, in the world of the gophers. Yeah, I won't tell any gophers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't spread this too far. Uh, All right. You know. Thank you. Thank oh, you no. so much, Scott. I really appreciate it.